Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Ask the Expert event. Today, we're going to be learning about birding and birds with expert David Sibley. I'm Craig Lamont. I'm a reporter at GBH News, and I'm a birding enthusiast myself. Thanks to everyone that's joining us today, including our leadership circle and RLS members. We really appreciate your continued generous support. Before we get started, I want to introduce the team behind the event. Um, they're going to be pulling the strings and connecting with you, but you're not going to see or hear them. Uh, but I want to introduce them uh, right now. Uh, first is my colleague, Bailey. Hi, Bailey. Hi, thanks, Craig. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad to have you here. Unlike us, you will not be able to, we will not be able to hear or see you. Uh, we thank you again for being here and we hope you enjoy the event. Back to you, Craig. Thanks so much. And uh, Ileana is also here. She's gonna be keeping an eye on our Q&A tab. Hi, Ileana. Hi, Craig, thank you so much. I'm hanging out in the Q&A tab today and we wanna hear all your questions. So all you have to do is click the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and be sure to let us know where you're tuning in from when you submit your question. If you see a question you want to hear the answer to, just give it a thumbs up and um, it'll boost it up to the top. Thanks so much for joining and have a great event. Thank you, Craig. Thanks, Ileana. And we actually have a closed captioning feature today. I just want to tell you about uh, if you click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen, you're going to get two transcription display options that are going to pop up. We recommend you choose the subtitle option that enables captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also choose full transcript and a sidebar window is going to open up where you can see what each speaker is saying. Uh, please bear in mind that uh, the closed captioning may be slightly delayed. Um, so uh, with that, without further ado, do. It's my pleasure to introduce David Sibley. Uh, David Allen Sibley is the author and illustrator of the series of successful guides, the, uh, the Sibley Guide to Birds. Uh, he's contributed to Smithsonian, to Science, to the Wilson Journal of Ornithology, Birding, Birdwatching, and North American Birds, and the New York Times. He's basically everywhere. Um, he also has a new book out, which I have right here, which is What It's Like to Be a Bird, an absolutely beautiful new book uh, from David Sibley. And he lives uh, here in Massachusetts. David, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, my pleasure, Craig. Thanks thanks to you and WGBH for putting this on. And thanks to everyone who's showing up for your, your interest in birds. It's uh, inspiring to, to me to see how much interest there is in this subject. You know, I, I, you know, I'm glad you said that, and I think there's actually maybe a growing interest in birding. Uh, I've sort of been hearing that, and I think, you know, a lot of us right now, we're home during the pandemic, we're looking at our windows at the birds in our own backyards. Um, you know, we got a feeder uh, recently, um, it took about a week or so before the, the birds started showing up to it, but then, you know, we started getting, you know, cardinals, we had some downy woodpeckers, black capped chickadees, um, of course, finches and sparrows, uh, and, and it's been fun actually getting out my, my Sibley guide and, and identifying what's out there. Uh, of course, we also got a lot of squirrels, um, and, uh, you know, we've been trying to figure out how to handle that. I just wanted to ask you, I mean, you have feeders at your place, right? Like, do you have advice for those of us with feeders? What, what should we be doing um, to make our, our feeders most successful? Yeah, so I mean, feeding birds is, it's really popular. It's really easy <laughs> and um, you can get feeders and, and bird food at anywhere, hardware stores, um, supermarkets, but it's, um, the birds are pretty choosy about what they like to eat. So, and it's a, they're always making decisions, constantly making decisions about the, the sort of cost benefit of, is it worth crossing that road or crossing that lawn to get to the feeder? So if you, the higher quality food you can put in your feeders, the more birds will come to eat it. Um, and there will be times when there is no, when, when the, the birds feel like they're better off just taking advantage of what natural food they can find and your feeders will be pretty quiet, no matter what you put in them. But what I feed usually is the highest quality food you can buy, which is um, uh, sunflower hearts um, or chips, the, the hulled sunflower seeds. And it's more expensive than the regular black oil sunflower seeds, which is the next best choice. But with the hulled sunflower seeds, you're not paying for the weight of the shells, so that offsets the cost a little bit. Um, more birds will use it because there's some species that can't, um, like goldfinches, have a hard time breaking through the shell of a sunflower seed, but they, they like the, the hearts. And also it doesn't leave a lot of waste on the ground, so you don't have that pile of, of uh, husks uh, building up on the ground underneath the feeders. So 
that's what I feed. But um, um, even with that, there are times when uh, the birds sort of eschew that for whatever they're finding on their own. Now, that's popular with the birds. It's probably also popular with the squirrels, I'm guessing. I don't know about you, but yeah. this has been a problem. Yeah. And before you go buying expensive food like that, you want to get your squirrel, <laughs> your squirrel population under control. And that's, a, that's, as most people know, a bigger challenge than, uh, uh, than it sounds. Yeah, they're smart. Uh, squirrels are so, so inventive, so um, uh, they're smart and, and they, they will find a way to get around whatever obstacle, obstacle you put in their way. Um, and get that food. Any, uh, any any tips? Any? There's no secret here. This we just have to figure it out for ourselves. There's some the the feeders with really mechanical barriers. So there's there are feeders that either um, like there's a cage, a spring loaded cage that hangs around the feeder, and when a something heavy like a squirrel grabs onto that cage, it pulls down, and it actually has metal doors that close the the access to the ports on the feeder. So as soon as a squirrel gets on and grabs onto that metal cage, it drops down and closes all the feeding ports and they can't get access to the seeds. And they'll still, they know the food is there. They'll still hang there and chew on the metal doors and try to get in. But, but that will, uh, that's one of the most it's effective. And there's anyway. another variety of a similar idea with a, um, a weight activated um, perch and when the squirrel jumps onto it, it, it closes the door to the food. So okay, we have, we have so to step light, it up they... there and, and try to figure out ways to get maybe a, a better feeder that's actually going to uh, stop them. You know, you know, looking at these birds in, in the feeder, I've been thinking about the fact that, you know, it's wintertime, right? These, these are not birds that migrate. Um, but I really don't know, like, what they're doing all winter. You know, I don't, I don't know, like, for example, where they are. Um, there, I, I, I can, there's no leaves on the trees. I can't see any nests. Like what, what are the birds, what is life like for a bird here in New England in the wintertime? Yeah. You mean, what are, what are they doing when they're not at the feeder? Yeah. When they're not at the feeder. <laughs> yeah. They're, they roam around. Most species in the winter have a, a well-defined sort of home range territory. Um, some species actually defend a territory, like a group of 10 or 12 chickadees will, will live as a group for the winter. And, um, and as a group, they'll defend a small territory. So, um, and in that territory, they find, they find food, they, they store food. A lot of the food that chickadees get at the feeder, they fly back into the woods and hide it somewhere like in a crevice in the bark. And they'll remember where that is and go back to it later. Um, so there, the, the birds will, will go sometimes, some birds a mile, half a mile from the feeder. Um, and, uh, and that's where they'll spend most of their time. Um, and they're finding natural food. And, and a lot of the day they spend just resting. Um, if, they, hmm. if they can find enough food, high quality food to continue to have enough energy to survive, then they'll just settle down. They'll fluff up their feathers, find a nice sheltered spot kind of in a tangle of branches somewhere where they're hard to see and protected from the wind. And they'll just fluff up, fluff up their feathers and, um, and rest there. So they spend a good part of the day doing that. And they're almost invisible. And they manage to, to stay warm through a cold New England winter. Yeah. Um, so we have, we have an absolute ton of questions already. And I want to remind people that um, if you have questions, you should uh, add them into the Q&A tab. Also, though, if you see questions that you'd like the answer to, uh, you can upvote them. And, and I can see sort of the, the, the questions that are most popular, that most people want answers to. Uh, and uh, we're probably going to try to get to, to most of those. So definitely upvote the questions that you're, you're interested in. And I want to just jump in because we have a lot of people here and a lot of great questions. Um, the top one right now is, is from Claudia Miller, who asks, she says, now that life is quieter, I often hear birds before I see them. Any, any tips for identifying birds by their songs? Uh, yeah, that's, um, it's a real challenge. And it's one that all birders confront. <laughs> birds make a lot of noise. They communicate by sound. So there, there's a lot of information there. 
and you can identify the species and learn something about what the bird is doing just from the sound. Um, and it's really, I compare it to learning a second language. Um, the key to learning is, is uh, constant repetition practice and, and immersion, if you can do that. The, it just um, paying attention to sounds is the first key, just actually noticing the sounds and listening. Mm. And gradually, your brain will get better and better at sorting them out. Um, it really, there's a big learning curve just to sort of understand the cadence and the, the kind of um, the, what's different about bird sounds. Um, so, and I've experienced that in my own, my own journey of learning bird songs that I'll hear, listen to some sounds and think, I'll just despair of ever um, telling the difference between them. And a year or two later, suddenly I recognize them and I can hear the difference. And it's just a question of um, sort of tuning your ears and, and gradually getting accustomed to the sounds that birds make and being able to hear those details. So it, it's gonna be an ongoing process, um, but paying attention to the sounds and, and categorizing, learning the sounds that you hear most often. Um, so um, if you have the time and the, the opportunity to actually track down a bird that's making a sound, if you, you hear a strange sound and you can actually listen to it, get closer to it, find the bird that's making the noise, that's one of the best ways to learn, to really kind of Is there a good lo the library of bird songs, that like some resource that people could go and listen if, if they hear and, and try to identify it? Yeah, there are a number of resources online now that are really excellent. Um, so you can hear recordings of, of bird songs, um, kind of a, an endless, <laughs> an endless amount. The Macaulay Library at Cornell um, has an incredible collection of bird sounds that are all available for listening. Um, a, a website called Zeno Canto with, a, with an X, Zeno Canto, okay. is also a great collection. And uh, you'll find lots of online resources for uh, listening to bird songs. Uh, great, great. Uh, Susan asks, are owl houses good ideas? How high do you install it on a tree? Uh, they live in Wayland on the edge of a conservation land and hear barred owls and great horned owls and screech owls at night. And she'd like to know uh, if maybe she should use a owl house. Ah, yeah, um, so owl, um, Owls are among the birds that don't build their own nest. They use other birds, other, other structures for nests. So some of the species nest in cavities, in trees. Um, and barred owls and screech owls and solid owls are three Massachusetts species that will use a box. Um, for a barred owl, you need a really big box. It's a big bird. So you need a, a big box with a big hole. And I don't know the measurements off the top of my head, but you'll find um, some measurements online. Um, screech owls and solid owls will use a smaller box the same size as um, a wood duck or smaller like kestrel. Um, and again, you can find the measurements online. And yeah, if you have owls in the area, putting up boxes um, is probably a, a small chance that you'll get owls actually using the box. But if you do, it's it's really rewarding. So if you have the energy and the, and the time and the opportunity, a place where you can actually put up a box, it's uh, it's worth a try. She had asked how high in the tree. What, what's your advice? Oh, on how that? high? Yeah, I think anywhere. Um, I mean, uh, there there birds are accustomed to using holes that are you know leftover woodpecker holes or other cavities in the trees. So. Um, Probably the, the higher you can get the box, the better, but a standard extension ladder like 12 feet or 14 feet is probably high enough. Okay. Um, yeah. Wow, all right, that'd be fun. Um, Chris wants to know what birds we should be on the lookout for right now. Who, who, who's out there and, and who are we looking for? Yeah, well, it's, um, it's still winter here in Massachusetts, but um, the first signs of spring are showing up and here, I mean, Finally. In, Deerfield, in Deerfield in Western Massachusetts, where it's still almost full snow cover on the ground, but a red-winged blackbird showed up a few days ago 
and has been singing, um, claiming its territory already. So that's the first real sign of, of spring arrival. Um, and over the next few weeks, as the snow melts and the temperatures warm, there will be uh, American woodcock will come back and start displaying more red, red winged blackbirds. Song sparrows might start singing. Um, and, uh, and then by mid-March, um, a good chance on warm days that Phoebes, um, tree swallows, birds like that will be coming back. Piping plovers will reappear on the beaches. Um, all that happens very soon as, uh, and depending on the weather. So if the weather is really nice and warm, these birds will push north and, and come back to their territories here in the north. And then if the weather closes in again, they'll disappear. And I guess they just go back south a few hundred miles. Um, it's amazing to think that they, you know, their migration is not a simple <laughs> coming north and staying. They, they might come north for a few days and then go back south, um, possibly hundreds of miles, and then make that journey again when the weather warms up again. But that we'll see that over the next few weeks and months uh, until early May is really when, when spring is here for good in, in Massachusetts. And then the big flood of warblers and orioles and tanagers and thrushes all come I, back. I think we all can't wait for a number of reasons <laughs> yes. actually for, for that to happen. Yeah. Um, uh, Lana from Boxford wants to know, you touched on this a little bit before, but about where the songbirds in her yard sleep and especially where they hang out during a snowstorm. Like when, 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 it's, when it's terrible out, what do they do? Yeah, they most of the songbirds will just find a sheltered spot um, in in some tangle of branches, or they they like um, a lot of birds like the really dense um, evergreen shrubs and trees that are common in suburbia, the arborvitae sort of um, where they can they can kind of burrow in through through the outer layer of greenery into the the twiggy layer near the trunk. And, and a lot of birds will roost in sites like that and spend the night there. They're protected from the wind, um, from snow, and, uh, uh, and they'll sleep there. Uh, out in the woods, birds will just find a, a branch, a, a twig to perch on. Um, usually they'll look for a, a spot that's a little bit more um, sheltered, like a, a mm -hmm. tangle of vines, uh, a denser cluster of twigs or, or an evergreen tree like a pine, someplace that gives them just a little bit more protection so that an owl can't just fly in un, uh, unobstructed and grab them off their twig. Yeah. Um, okay. And they're protected from the weather a little. You know, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your artistic process. Um, you know, we're looking uh, behind you now, we can see some of your your uh, beautiful yeah. illustrations. And, and of course, I think we've all seen your books. And I think it's, it's just amazing to, to think that one person painted all of these birds. Um, and so beautifully, can you tell us a little bit about how, how you do you, what you do? What is your day like? Are you, are you painting all day? Are you bird watching? Are you sketching when you're out there? Tell us a little bit uh, how, how you do it. Yeah, my, my days now are a mix of many different things, but when I'm painting, I, I, um, it's, it all begins with field observation and sketching. Um, and I've done a tremendous amount of that. That's uh, for about 12 years straight from 1980 to 92, I was in the field birding every day, uh, most days from dawn to dusk and uh, doing lots of pencil sketches. Um, the painting came, come later in the studio so I rely on my sketches for sort of inspiration and, and refreshing my mental image of the birds. And then I use photographs to make sure I get all the details right. Um, but always kind of interpreting the photographs through the filter of my own experience and my, my mental image. Um, Do you have anything um, that you're working on there that you might be able to, to give us a sneak preview of? Yes, I have a few. Um, So I have, when I'm doing a painting, I, I begin with a pretty rough um, outline of the bird in pencil. And this is a warbler. Um, 
that I'm about to start painting. So I'll, I'll start with this pretty rough pencil outline and then fill in all the paint and um, make adjustments as I go. Um, so did, did you I do have... that just entirely from memory, just knowing what a warble looks like? Well, uh, no. <laughs> and I do, so I'll do a sketch. I'll do some sketches and uh, I'll look at my own sketches, look at photographs, get some ideas of the pose I want, work on, work on the sketch and the proportions and all of that. And then once I get the sketch um, that I like, I have a projector, an opaque projector that projects an image. So I can put my, my rough draft sketch into the projector. It projects that image down onto the table. And then for the finished thing like that, uh, I have that sheet of paper on the table and I trace the projected image. Um, so I get a clean, cool. a, a clean outline based on my sketch. Yeah. Um, and once I start um, painting, this is a marsh wren that I've done a few layers of paint on. So I'll begin with the, the shadows, actually, the gray shading around the underside of the body and some other shaded areas to start to get the um, sort of the, the shape of the bird established and then add some details of color and keep building it up in, in layers. Um, it's many, many layers of uh, transparent paint in my paintings. So wow. this is about halfway through. So beautiful. That's great. We have a, a, a ton more questions. So I think I'm going to jump yeah. ahead and, and ask. Um, Lynn asks, uh, she said, last year we built a bluebird birdhouse according to recommendations we read and saw some bluebirds at it, but they didn't nest. Can you give us uh, some reasons as to why and what to do to encourage them to stay? Yeah, um, they're, birds are, they're, they're picky. They're, they're cautious about where they choose to nest. So um, you'll never have a hundred percent success rate of putting up boxes and having birds use them. Um, it's a good sign that you had some interest and it's very possible that um, that, that was a young pair looking at the box last year and maybe just sort of checking it out and they'll remember it and come back. It's very possible that they'll come back this year. Okay. Um, you Right now is when you might see some activity. So now is the time to put up birdhouses um, to give the birds a chance to investigate, consider their choices and then, and then choose one. Um, so the fact that some bluebirds saw it last year is maybe a good sign that they'll come back and and uh, use it this year. Um, That's a uh, great tip, actually. I, that now is the time to put a birdhouse out because I've been wanting to, and I'm going to do it right away. Actually, yeah, um, that's a yeah, that's good to know. If you put up a birdhouse in May, a lot of birds have already started nesting, so right. they'll they might look at it and say, "Oh, <laughs> I wish we'd had that one." <laughs> Can't <laughs> but it's trade too up. late. Yeah, um, and another option is um, you know put up more houses. Um, the the one that you put up might the 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 region might be okay. The birds might be happy enough with the general the the habitat the territory in general, but they might not like the exact location of that box. So if you put up three or four, um, you're more likely to have one that that is a winner. Um, okay. And also with bluebird houses, other birds like house wrens, house sparrows, tree swallows will all use the same boxes. So if you have trouble with those species kind of taking over all the boxes, the solution to that is to put up more boxes um, and just make, make more space available for everyone who wants it. Okay, great question from Marion. I'd love to know the answer to this. She wants to know, should we feed birds from feeders during the summer or should we be taking this down? Yeah, that's often a question, and um, there's no reason not to. Um, a lot of people stop feeding birds in the summer, and you'll get less, generally less activity at your bird feeder in the summer. Mm -hmm. But I feed year-round um, in general, or, you know, it gets tricky in Massachusetts because of bears. <laughs> bears come out um, pretty soon now. Depending on out. what neighborhood of Massachusetts you're in. Yeah, and... Um, uh, so, I mean, the state, uh, the state um, actually discourages bird feeding uh, in the, during bear season, and, and bear season technically is year-round. They can appear anytime. So, um, 
if you have bear trouble in your area, then bird feeding might not be an option at all. But um, uh, but yes, there's no there's nothing wrong with feeding through the summer, and you'll get lots of uh, young birds. The the chickadees will bring their their fledged young around to use the feeders, the titmice, the house finches. Um, here we're lucky to have rose-breasted grosbeaks that the families of rose-breasted grosbeaks will come and and uh, all use the feeder in July and August. So yeah, there's nothing wrong with it. And um, uh, lots of birds will use it and take advantage of that food. Here's another one I would personally love the answer to. Joanne wants to know if she can get hummingbirds in her backyard in Massachusetts, north of Boston. Are they around? Can, we, can I get them? Yeah, yeah, hummingbirds are, they're everywhere. And, um, and they love feeders. Um, uh, so the, um, and what you put in the hummingbird feeder, it's plain sugar, plain white sugar and water. You don't need to add anything else to it. Don't, don't put any dye in it. Don't, you don't have to make the liquid red. Um, but the- This is essentially plain, the, the simple syrup that I put in cocktails? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, a little, little more diluted than that. Okay. Um, actual flower nectar is, I think, anywhere from um, one part sugar to like eight parts water up to 40 parts water. It's pretty diluted. Um, what, what's recommended for hummingbird feeders is about one to four uh, or one to three. So um, a cup of water with a third cup of sugar um, at the most. And, and then um, just make sure you change the, the liquid regularly, keep the feeder clean. And, uh, and eventually hummingbirds will discover it and they have an incredible memory. Um, hummingbirds can remember um, uh, many, probably thousands of different locations of feeders. The, the flowers that have adapted to be pollinated by hummingbirds are mostly, um, mostly red, mostly tubular flowers that fit the hummingbird's bill and they're mostly perennial plants. So they grow in the same location every year and the hummingbirds remember those locations year after year and come back to visit the same flowers. So, so they're migratory as well, right? Because clearly those red flowers are not here in New England in the, in the winter, right? So they're right. coming back? Right, yeah. So the hummingbirds, the, the hummingbirds that are in Massachusetts in the summer are right now in Central America, Southern Mexico, Belize, Costa Rica, and they'll be back um, beginning of May or very end of April, they start to come back and um, spend a Isn't few that incredible that then... those little things can go so far? <laughs> it just blows me away every it time is. I hear that. It is. They weigh less than a nickel and uh, fly thousands of miles. It's amazing. Um, uh, uh, the, one person would like tips for identifying shorebirds in New England. I, I would say, actually, I have one tip, which is, which is this right here, I think, actually can give you a lot of information about identifying shorebirds, but there are other, other tips other than picking this up that you would recommend. Yeah, um, well, experience is the, the, best, <laughs> the best teacher. Um, and I think that, you know, shorebirds are difficult partly because we usually see them at a distance. So um, if you can find a place where you can see shorebirds up close, um, the sandpipers we're talking about, the, um, yeah. and there's a wide, there are many, many species, only a few species are really common, and then there's a lot of uncommon species that are um, sought after, and, and they're, all, they're all variations on the same theme, sort of brownish with medium long bills. And, um, uh, but if you can find a place where you can see some up close and really see the details, take advantage of that and really study those um, spend some time there watching those individuals, watching that. And if there'll probably be a couple of species, often when I'm on Cape Cod in the summer, there'll be sanderlings is the most common species there on the beach. But among the sanderlings, once in a while, you'll see a semi-palmated sandpiper, semi-palmated plover, um, black-bellied plover, a few other species will, will join in with those sanderlings and they'll, they'll walk within a few feet of you on the beach. Um, so spending time there watching those birds up close and, and learning the differences in the way they move, their proportions, um, the details of the plumage, you'll be much better prepared to identify them 
from a hundred yards away or more, which is unfortunately the way we usually see them. Yeah, right. Um, good question here uh, from Skylar is, are there ideal times for going birding? Uh, yeah, in general, it's true that the, the early morning, the, the, the earlier the better is the best time for birding. Um, so there's, there's a lot of activity in the summer, even before sunrise, the dawn chorus. Um, birds are singing, um, uh, lots of birds are singing before sunrise. Um, the peak activity of actual visual, visible activity of birds is um, usually just after sunrise and then for an hour or two. Mm -hmm. um, and it tapers off gradually after that. Um, so are they just more active then? Is there a reason what's going on? Yeah, they're more active and it's, it's probably that they're, um, you know, birds lose about 10% of their body weight overnight, every night. Um, what? Through, <laughs> yes. Really? Yes. Through defecation and evaporation of water, um, they're processing all the food that they've taken in during the day. So they basically load up with food during the day and then process it all at night. So they're, they're losing, um, losing a lot of weight and, and burning a lot of energy to keep warm overnight. Um, and when they wake up in the morning, they're hungry. <laughs> they want, they need food. They need a lot of energy. And the, there's no certainty for birds or there's very little certainty for them. It's not like they can just, you know, stumble down to the corner store and get a bag of Doritos to, to get some quick energy. <laughs> they've, they've got to actually find food and, and yeah. hope that they, they can find food and not, um, and avoid predators and everything else. So, um, so they, I think this is my, my speculation that they, they wake up in the morning and they're like, food, I need food, I've got to find it, I've got to make sure I have enough food for the day. And they spend the first couple hours of the day just frantically um, uh, foraging, looking for food. And if they can find enough then to satisfy um, most of their needs, then they can kind of relax for the rest of the day. And mm. I think that's what most birds do. And they'll keep foraging off and on through the rest of the day just to kind of maintain but I think their primary foraging is early in the morning. So um, it's a good time to go, go spot them. Okay. That's yeah. Great. And it, and crazy question from Mabel here. She says, here in Pepperell, I have seen a few goldfinches with conjunctivitis. Do you know how widespread this disease is in Massachusetts? Also, how, how can you tell if a bird has conjunctivitis? Yeah, conjunctivitis, it's an, it's an eye disease. Um, people get it also. It's a... Yeah. Um, eye infection and birds with conjunctivitis you'll see them with the eye sort of squinted closed or in really severe cases the eye you can kind of see the infection around the eye it looks puffy and red and um, the eye is is closed um, and it's a it's a disease that spreads through close contact it's very contagious among birds um, so it, it spreads at bird feeders where birds are in close proximity. Is that um, an argument against bird feeders? It is when there's a lot of conjunctivitis around. And I've seen, um, I've seen quite a few, quite a bit of it this winter among the house finches here at our house. House finches seem particularly susceptible to it. And there was a big outbreak um, maybe 10 years ago among house finches. Um, uh, but yeah, it's recommended that if, if you see a, a lot of birds at your feeders with conjunctivitis, um, it's better to stop feeding for a couple of weeks and not, so you force social distancing <laughs> among the birds. Um, it's, uh, uh, so you you, uh, you stop them from gathering at your feeders and, yeah. and hopefully help slow the spread of conjunctivitis. But it is a it's a disease that that is always there. At, and this winter there seem to be a few more cases than normal from what I'm seeing. Um, 
but it, it seems to affect the finches, house finches in particular, and, and less often the goldfinches and siskins and other things. It seems somehow unsurprising that this winter, uh, even the birds need to socially distance. Uh, yeah. So um, we have so many fantastic questions from the audience. Thank you all for your questions. Please keep them coming. Um, but I want to take a moment now to introduce my colleague, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Greg, sorry about that. And thanks everyone for spending some time while we ask our ex expert David Sibley about bird watching. Viewers and listeners turn to GBH for many reasons, whether it's to learn something new about birds or to simply be entertained for a while. If you feel GBH is worth listening to, worth watching and worth supporting, then please make a donation. Today, when you donate $90 all at once or in $7.50 monthly installments as a GBH sustainer, we will send you an autographed copy of David Ann Sibley's latest book, What It's Like to Be a Bird, as a thank you gift. So please visit wgbh.org slash support events, or you can text GBH to 800-492-1111 using keyword GBH to make a donation. To make a donation in any amount, every dollar our donors give enables GBH to continue producing great virtual events like this one year round on a wide range of topics from birding to storytelling to baking and more. Audience support provides GBH the wind beneath our wings. And thanks again for joining us. And now back to Craig. Thanks so much, Sarah. And uh, I absolutely love this book, by the way, David. I think it's 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 different than all your others or most of your others anyway, in that it's just full of sort of the stories of these individual birds, right? And, and I mean, it's, it's what it's like to be a bird uh, what birds are doing and why. I mean, like, I think that's kind of what we're all trying to find out. So it's actually, it's great that uh, if, if people make a donation that they can actually get this and they're supporting yeah. uh, our ability to have events like this. So thank you for supporting and, and, and definitely that's a, a book that you'd love to have, I can tell you. Um, I wanna jump right back in the questions. And I think what we're gonna do here, David, because because we got so many people and so many great questions. Can we try like a lightning round here? I'm just going to fire questions at you and then let's okay. let's see, see if we can get through as many as, as we can uh, for, for the next few minutes. Okay. Uh, first, can you recommend binoculars for beginning bird watchers that won't break the bank? Um, not a specific brand. I'm not up on that, but um, uh, go for seven or eight power binoculars. Don't don't go higher than that. Um, it's uh, much easier to handle and um, uh, yeah, it's a better choice for, uh, for general birding. All right, lightning round. David, do you have a favorite bird Liz wants to know? I don't have one favorite bird. I, I enjoy all birds. Um, I like the wood warblers that come back in the spring in, a, in a two months or so. I like owls, um, but I'm happy to watch any bird that's in front of me anytime. Al uh, would like to know, what can we do most to help birds? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, many, there, there's a lot of things. Um, supporting organizations that, that um, work with bird conservation, um, um, Massachusetts Audubon Society, the Nature Conservancy, American Bird Conservancy um, are great great groups to support in your backyard. You can um, uh, work on backyard habitat. There's a lot of information about that online. Use less pesticides in your yard. Um, cover your windows to keep birds from crashing into them. Keep cats indoors um, and uh, support conservation um, legislation. Climate change is a big threat to, to everything. So uh, birds, birds included. Um, so all of that. Um, okay, great. Moving, we, we jump into more. Uh, Victor wants to know about cleaning our bird feeders. Do we need to do that? Yeah, you should clean your bird feeders regularly. And um, the easiest way to do it is like a garbage can filled with water and a little bit of bleach. And you just uh, take the bird feeder empty, dunk it in the garbage can, get a long handled brush to scrub it a little bit and then let it dry and refill it with food. Okay. David wants to know what your favorite New England birding location is. My favorite New England birding location. Currently, it's my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> I always like local. Um, I really enjoy, I mean, the classics, Plum Island, Cape Ann, um, 
uh, the Cape Cod uh, Provincetown race point is just always exciting. Um, but I but I'm really enjoying my own yard, just the surroundings here in Deerfield. Lynn has a question. I've never heard this before. Chili powder for squirrels. Does that work? Yeah, I, I've heard about that. I don't have I haven't tried it myself. And I've I've heard from a few people who have tried it and said it doesn't it, it didn't keep the squirrels away. Um, so it might be worth a try. It's the the pepper, the the chemical, the hot chemical in pepper, the capsaicin. Um, that uh, mammals can taste and and don't like, and birds apparently don't taste it, so it doesn't bother them. But um, it's worth a try if uh, you you're mix it in with the seed. Problem. Is that how, how does it work? Yeah, yeah, you have to mix it with the seed, and I guess I assume you'd have to put enough on that every seed would would have some coating of uh, capsaicin on it. Hmm. Uh, Karen wants to know if there's a way to discourage the many many sparrows that take over her feed. Yeah, house sparrows, I assume. Um, yeah, and in urban, more urban settings, house sparrows are really common and um, very devoted visitors <laughs> to feeders. I've heard about a, a weird trick that um, you can hang monofilament strands from the feeder. And for some reason, house sparrows are really frightened of that. <laughs> um, and it keeps them away. I, I've never been in a place where I needed that. Um, I've never had a, a feeder that was taken over by house sparrows, but a lot of people have told me that that works. So try hanging a few strands of monofilament and let them dangle down below the feeder. Uh, and something about that scares away house sparrows, apparently. All right, great tip. Give it a shot. Uh, Ellen wants to know, or Ellen wants to know, uh, how to deter woodpeckers from making holes in the house. This is a problem mm. that I had, or my family had growing up. And I think what, at the time we thought it was um, that there were uh, bees, there were carpenter bees that were drilling holes in the house and laying, I think, eggs in there and that the woodpeckers were trying to get at the, uh, at the holes. Yeah, it's, um, uh, there, Woodpeckers make holes like that when they're looking for food, and and for some reason they think there is a reason to make a hole in the house. So, I guess the first the first thing would be to um, check and make sure there aren't uh, carpenter ants or or termites or bees, some other um, pest making uh, causing a bigger problem in your house. Um, the um, some researchers did a study of this uh, maybe 15 years ago, and they found that the um, most of the cases where this happens, the siding of the house is natural colored, a light brown, tan, wood color. And one of the solutions is to paint the house an unnatural color. Sort of a pretty, uh, pretty costly solution and a pretty major one, but yeah, but but holes in the siding is uh, is is even more costly. So yeah, um, so. yeah, you, there's a, a lot of you could try hanging um, uh, like hanging strips of mylar um, or CDs, some some uh, really obvious material. If you hang it up there. Um, it'll scare the woodpeckers away. Um, you'd have to hang a bunch of strips of mylar so that everywhere the woodpecker tried to land when it flew in, it's the, the air movement of its wings would make all the mylar flutter and uh, scare it off. Um, covering the side of the house with netting or canvas or something like that would prevent them from making holes. But um, I assume when you take those things down, the woodpeckers will probably come back. Okay, it's a tough, it's a tough one. It is, a, um, yeah, it is a tough one. Yeah. Uh, Susan wants to know: Is there a way to bird watch at night? Where on the tree should we look for roosting? She says. Also, she mentions in Costa Rica, the birds hang out at the top, uh, or at the tip of the branches. I don't know if that is that specific to Costa Rica or where. Where do we look for birds at night? Yeah. Um, so and that's an interesting question. I've never. Never heard that one before. I, very rarely when I've been out walking at night with a flashlight, I have run across birds roosting. And so you could go with a strong light and, and just sort of scan the twigs looking for birds roosting. Um, you'll probably find one eventually. Um, uh, 
some species roost in conspicuous places. So um, if you're on the coast where there are egrets, um, herons, um, things like that, they'll roost uh, on on treetops, and they'll 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 all gather in in habitual roosting locations. So if there's a known roost, you'll be able to go look at that at night, but you want to be really careful if you're going to a place like that to avoid disturbing the birds at night. So if you if you shine your light and birds start getting nervous and sort of clucking and muttering and moving around and flapping, um, you're you're making you're making them nervous and, and causing a disturbance and that could have some really uh, serious consequences for them. So um, avoid doing that, <laughs> but, yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, you could probably find some songbirds at night by uh, just roaming around in the woods and scanning the, scanning the twigs with the flashlight. Okay, all right, that's worth a shot, that'd be fun. Um, Doris says, we have a pileated completing a, a, a nesting hole or roosting hole in a pine in our backyard it seems early for this activity. Is this climate change? Mm. Um, well, yeah, studies have shown across the country that, that birds have advanced their cycles by a few days up to a couple of weeks, depending on the species and the location. Um, with climate change. So as the as this weather gets warmer, the spring comes earlier and the birds are nesting earlier. Um, but it wouldn't be by more than uh, a few days or maybe a, a week, 10 days. Um, I'm not surprised that a pileated woodpecker might be um, working on a nesting hole this early. They're, they're resident birds. They're, they're here year round. And um, it takes it probably takes them a good ten days to really excavate a complete nesting hole. Um, so they might already be working on that. Another question I would have is if they're if it's actually a nesting hole. Sometimes when they're really when they find a really good uh, source of carpenter ants, which is their favorite food, they'll they'll make a giant hole in the tree. So if it's a if it's an oval, an oblong hole, a rectangular vertical hole, that's a foraging hole. Um, when they build a nest hole, it's almost round. Um, so that the shape of the hole will tell you whether it's a, a foraging hole or a nest hole. And um, I wouldn't be too surprised to, to learn that it is a nest hole that they're already working on. Uh, a lot of species, the red-tailed hawks are courting um, great horned owls are already they're, they're already on nests, incubating eggs. Um, they nest very early. Are there other impacts of climate change that we're seeing right now? Uh, yeah, a lot. A lot of impacts are already showing. Um, birds are arriving earlier in the spring, leaving later in the fall. Southern species are shifting north. Um, most species are getting less less numerous at the southern edge of their range and more numerous at the northern edge, suggesting that they're all slight, slowly shifting north. Um, in the Arctic, there are huge changes. Um, and there, it's um, as the climate gets milder, the, the plants that, you know, the, the tundra is willows and birches that are only a few inches high. Um, a lot of the a lot of the plant cover on the tundra is is willows and birches, and as soon as the climate allows, those plants will grow a foot high, three feet high. So a lot of tundra is turning into shrubland mm. um, simply because the winters are less severe, and the plants, the same plants that have been there all along, as ground hugging um, tundra plants, can uh, can kind of spread their spread out and grow taller um, and sea level rise is is happening um, and that's affecting some Massachusetts birds like the salt marsh sparrow this right little sparrow that nests in salt marshes um, they nest just above the high tide line and as the high tides get higher each year the um, and the marshes are subsiding so the 
the the net effect is even worse that the their nests are more likely to get flooded um, so lots of yeah lots of consequences are happening already okay uh kayla says we had an eastern screech owl move into our backyard nesting box um, but the building next door just put up large outdoor lights that now shine right into that box at night. Um, do you think that'll disturb the owls? Is there anything else that we could do? Um, you know, it might not disturb the owl. They're, um, uh, uh, it's, you know, I guess the, the best, um, the best thing would be to block, to put up some kind of shade to, to block the light and maybe you could talk to your neighbors and ask them to put up some kind of um, shade on the light itself to keep the light from spilling into your yard. Um, that seems like a reasonable request. Um, it's possible that it won't bother the owl, but um, I guess time will tell. Um, okay. Kayla also had another question that I, I have to ask because I, I kind of love it. She wants to know what your favorite song is. Not your favorite bird song specifically, just what your favorite song is. So, oh. <laughs> my favorite song. Wow. It's a tough um, one. Oh, I can't. Uh... <laughs> oh, we managed to stump you. <laughs> yeah, I'm stumped. <laughs> yeah, to pick just one. Um, I'm a I'm a kind of alt alt rock indie folk rock fan. So Richard Thompson, uh, many Richard Thompson songs would be uh, in the running. Um, I'll leave it at that. Okay. All right. Moving on. Uh, Catherine says my husband's lifelong quest is to attract Orioles. She says the orange feeder with grape jelly and oranges didn't work. I is that even something that people try uh i've never heard of that before how yeah. do you attract an oriole yeah orioles love they like oranges they like grape jelly and wow. um if you know if you have orioles in your yard and you put those things out they will discover them and uh and take advantage of that um Orioles that have experience with those things will also recognize it. Um, so, and they might have experience with it from the wintering grounds. A lot of uh, eco lodges and places like that in, in Central America where the Orioles winter will put out oranges. So the Orioles might already recognize that as a, a real treat. And if they spot it uh, in your yard, they'll, they'll come down to uh, check it out. But if you don't already have Orioles in your yard or in the neighborhood, it's it's unlikely or it, it's going to be a long shot to get them just sort of dropping in to uh, feast on an orange. All so right, well, um, I keep putting them out there and just hope <laughs> I guess yeah. this is the thing. Um, we had a uh, question from Courtney who says, last summer there seemed to be an exceptionally large number of hawks and even eagles around our neighborhood, which is in Winchester, Mass. Um, is this a fluke or is there some reason for that? Uh, it, it could, well, hawks, hawks and eagles are opportunistic. They'll go where the food is. Um, uh, Red-tailed hawk is a species that has increased tremendously in the suburbs uh, in the last few decades. Uh, it used to be a real kind of rural farmland bird. When I was um, starting birding in Connecticut uh, in the 70s, um, you know, red-tailed hawk was something you would see along the highway or out in the farmland. But mm. nowadays it's there, well, there's the famous pair in Central Park, New York City, um, and another pair at right near Alewife Station in, in um, Boston, um, nesting on a building. Um, and hunting, Mount Auburn Cemetery has a couple of pairs that are really uh, well known. And, and um, so it could be that with red-tailed hawks that they're continuing to expand and populate the suburbs and you might have a pair that just moved into your neighborhood. And they might be, they'll be more conspicuous at some times depending on where the food is, if they're finding a lot of food um, right around your house, um, you'll see them a lot more. 
Okay. Uh, we have a question about uh, the grackles descending in a group uh, and emptying out feeders since it clearly hearts of sunflower seeds are too expensive for grackles. Uh, I guess, <laughs> what, do you, what do you do about your grackles? Uh, yeah, there's a, the value judgment of <laughs> who, who deserves sunflower there's a hierarchy hearts. there. Yeah. But yes, it would be very expensive to feed sunflower hearts to a big flock of grackles. Um, yeah, they'll generally they'll they'll only come periodically, um, at least to places where I've been. That we get a flock of grackles sort of swooping in for twenty minutes one day, and then then they're gone. Um, so if um, uh, if you have grackles more often than that, I don't then you you need to look into um, other kinds of feeders. They're feeders that are designed for just small birds. So in that case, it's like a wire cage with openings too small for a grackle to go through. Um, and I mean, you could build something like that yourself if you're handy with with wire, um, you know, chicken wire, um, and just um, make a cage that that the grackles can't get through, but chickadees and titmice and uh, smaller birds can. And that would prevent the grackles from getting at the feeder itself. They'll still get the food that's on the ground um, or an unprotected feeder, but that's the way to keep larger birds like grackles off of the food. Okay, great tip. Okay. Um, I wanna just bring back Sarah for a moment uh, to, uh, to chat with us for a second. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Craig. And hi again, everyone. Just one more reminder that contributions from viewers like you support GBH's ongoing efforts to develop new content to make your day a little brighter. You, yes, you at home can make more events like Ask the Expert possible. Just visit wgbh.org slash support events, or you can text GBH to 800-492-1111 using keyword GBH to make a donation. Today, if you donate $90 all at once or $750 a month as a sustainer, we will send you an autographed copy of David Ann Sibley's latest book, What It's Like to Be a Bird, as a thank you gift. And as we navigate this ever-changing reality, all donations from GBH viewers, listeners, and virtual event guests help keep us going. Donate today in any amount to become a GBH investor, and now more than ever, your commitment makes a difference. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. And Unfortunately, we are out of time. We uh, I got through as many questions as we could, um, and there were so many fantastic questions from Star that we couldn't get to more of them. I will say, however, though, that a lot of these great questions, I think, are actually addressed here uh, in, in, in your book, What It's Like to Be a Bird. Uh, it's full of fantastic information, and you can actually get it if you, you give to, to GBH right now. Um, but it's it's absolutely a beautiful book, David, and, and uh, I, I've, I've really been enjoying it, and so is my family. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much for being with us today. This was absolutely fascinating. It's so great to, to hear from you uh, and to, you know, we've been enjoying your beautiful artwork and, and your books for, for years. Uh, and it's just, a, it's a treat to have a chance to talk with you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, it's been my pleasure. And, uh, and thank you to the audience. Again, we, we really appreciate you all being here. Um, we can, uh, you know, we, every time we have a chance to do something like this, we're thrilled to have a chance to talk directly with you and to, to share these kinds of events with you. So thank you so much for being with us and, and please come back. We'll have more great events like this uh, in the future. Thanks again. <laughs>